Hi, my name is Matt Patrick, and I'm a geologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory as part of the U.S. Geological Survey. And today, in this presentation, I wanted to basically show some video highlights of the past decade or so of eruptions on Kilauea. So, you know, as geologists, we're out in the field regularly observing, um, you know, trying to make sense of what's happening uh, with the naked eye. But uh, one of the best ways to document, you know, what we're seeing, of course, is with uh, high quality video. So here's an example on the slide of our 4K uh, camera uh, documenting the opening phase of the current um, eruption in Halemaumau um, that began in September. So this is, um, just to give you a kind of a map overview, here's the island of Hawaii, uh, also known as the Big Island, and Kilauea volcano is in the southeast portion, kind of within this box here. So, and here it is zoomed in, and uh, so uh, the structure of the volcano is such that there's a summit caldera here, and then there are two rift zones, the southwest rift zone and the east rift zone that goes down along here. And um, what I'll be talking about today are eruptions in kind of three basic locations. Um, I'll talk about an assortment of eruptions at the summit, in the summit caldera, and then on the uh, Middle East rift zone, we had the eruption of Pu'o'o that began in 1983, went to 2018, and then um, recently, in 2018, we had the very destructive Lower East Rift Zone eruption here um, in Leilani Estates. So, but first, I want to talk about well the eruption that started first, which was the Pu'o'o eruption um, right here. So, so what you see are this video, um, video that we took a few years, well, uh, I think six years ago of a typical Pahoehoe lava flow. And this is the type of lava that really typified the, most of the uh, eruption at Pu'o'o. And um, you can see it's kind of slow moving, it's very fluid, uh, has this kind of ropey texture, you know, very classic uh, textbook Pahoehoe lava. And in one of these segments, this is, okay, so this is shown by a factor, sped up by a factor of 20. And so it kind of shows how the lava is kind of oozing out in these toes, but at the same time, the uh, the surface is inflating. And so these pohoihoi flows kind of move and fits and starts as lava um, kind of extrudes along the edges, and then inflates, and then kind of extrudes again. So because it's slow moving, it's relatively safe to um, approach and sample. And here's Tim uh, collecting a, a liquid lava sample here. Um, and the reason that we do this is actually very important for the science and to understand the eruption and the hazards. Um, this is meant for uh, studying the chemistry of the lava. And the chemistry of the lava can tell us about you know, where that magma was kind of stored in the volcano, how long it sat there, and whether it has a direct route from the summit, magma chamber. It can kind of tell us more about the magmatic plumbing system. So these samples are actually very valuable to understand the eruption and, um, and how it's progressing. Now, I showed you kind of the typical activity, which was these slow-moving pohoihoi flows, but what I'm showing here is actually one of the more um, kind of fascinating phases. Um, this has only happened a handful of times in that eruption. Uh, and what happened, this is a, sometimes, some people call it a fire hose, um, is basically where the lava that was entering the ocean, um, you know, it usually moves, kind of builds a delta and kind of moves through uh, lava tubes in the delta, but what happened is that delta and the Part of the sea cliff collapsed and it kind of exposed um, the lava tube in high up in the sea cliff. So the lava in the lava tube was just pouring out. And uh, here's a zoomed in view of that, um, really fascinating. And of course, what you see are these small explosions because obviously that hot lava entering cold ocean water, it's flashing the steam and uh, fragmenting the lava. Okay, so we talked about the Pu'o'o eruption here, and now I want to go to the summit caldera of Kilauea, and what we're going to talk about is the eruption that began in 2008, and it went for uh, about 10 years, 2008 to 2018, um, the lava lake that was active in Halemaumau Crater. So this is Halemaumau Crater, and then here is the old HVO building, well, and that was Jagger Museum. So here's Halemaumau Crater. You can see it's a kind of a shallow, circular crater. And within that crater, there is a smaller crater, which we call the Overlook Crater, and that hosts the active lava lake. 
And you can see the lava lake is composed of these um, you know, black crustal plates with incandescent kind of uh, spreading zones between, and there's an area of spattering here in the corner. This black lava is when lava briefly kind of overflowed the rim here in 2015. And here's a view from the rim. Again, a nice view of Mauna Loa in the background. Yeah, again, you can see kind of these large crustal plates and incandescent spreading zones. Uh, this is kind of at dusk or a little bit after dusk. Um, very slow moving surface. Uh, the lava is upwelling in this area and kind of flowing generally towards the south here. Um, but it's so slow, it's hard to see in that video. Here's a zoomed in view of the spattering, which is pretty fascinating. Um, this was happening almost constantly in the lake. And, you know, this is maybe 10 yards high or so. And you can kind of see the undulating lava surface as those bubbles break. Um, the lava in the lake was very gas rich. You can see it kind of bubbling here. And here's um, kind of a slug of gas that kind of reached the surface and burst. So this is another close up of the spatterings taken at night. And what's interesting about this is it's kind of counterintuitive in the sense that um, what you see is the lava surface that's flowing towards the fountaining, right? Um, I think that's counterintuitive because I think most uh, folks would think that, you know, the fountaining is where lava is coming up to the surface and you think that the lava would flow away from the source. But we see the opposite. And um, it's the, the way to view it is not as kind of this, the area where lava is rising up to the surface. But the spattering instead is actually um, large gas bubbles, you know, several yard size bubbles, spherical bubbles of gas that are bursting. And you get all those gas bubbles bursting at the surface and they kind of create a void space and a depression that the surrounding lava just kind of plunges into. And this pattern of um, lava flowing into the spattering sources was observed even in the early 1900s when the lava lake was active in Holy Mountain then. Uh, Thomas Jagger, who founded HVO, called it the down-sucking effect. And then um, Frank Parrott, who's another early HVO um, geologist, called it the siphoning effect. So both of those terms kind of give you the sense of um, lava kind of being drawn towards the spattering. OK, so this is a, from one of our webcams. It's sped up. Yeah, and what you saw there was actually a collapse of the uh, rim into the lake the lake you can see is very gas rich, bubbly, triggered an explosion. Okay, so um, what I want to show here is um, it's a video of um, a thermal from a thermal camera that's stationed on the rim showing the lava lake here within the crater. And then these two plots kind of track uh, the activity as the video progresses. And it's showing two things. It's showing the elevation of the lake surface in meters above sea level. And then it's going, showing ground tilt here. So the ground tilt is basically just well, what you expect. It's showing um, when the values are higher, it's showing inflation. When the values are lower, it's showing deflation. And um, let's see. Yeah, OK, so we're tracking this through time. And what we're seeing is a really remarkable correlation between the level of the lava in the lake and the ground tilt. And we know that the ground tilt is actually kind of a proxy, or it's an indicator of the pressure in that underlying magma chamber, right? So basically what we see is that the lava lake level is mirroring, mimicking the pressure state in the underlying magma chamber that's you know, a couple miles down below the surface. And so what this is showing is that, that the level, the elevation of the lava lake, is kind of like a giant pressure gauge, or like a giant barometer of that underlying uh, magma chamber. And actually this was helpful in um, hazard forecasting uh, because obviously when you have you know an inflated kind of pressurized state then you're more susceptible to um, eruptions say on the rift zone. Okay so next let's talk about the low reach rift zone. This is a major one of the most significant eruptions on Kilauea in the past 200 years and uh, by far the most destructive unfortunately. Uh, it occurred low on the volcano's flanks here, um, covered a lot of residential areas, caused a lot of destruction, and um, I'll be showing some slides from there. 
Okay, so this is the opening day of the eruption, or the second day in the opening phases, and we're here on this road in Leilani Estates, and you can hear this kind of um, beeping, and that's um, actually the house there. Um, I think it's a smoke alarm. Um, but what we, see, what we see here are cracks on the road, new cracks on the road, and some fuming from these cracks. And you saw um, in that where the house was, there was a lot of fume coming out through the house. Um, and this, we had been to this spot I don't know, hours earlier, and it wasn't like this. So this was, it looked like something was developing. So here we're standing on the road, and here's actually people um, evacuating up here. We have these cracks, and still fuming from the ground and the cracks. You can see actually a little bit of fuming here. It's almost like if yeah, the ground is kind of breathing. I'll just let this play through. It's a little bit long, but um, the video doesn't convey it. But as we were standing there, we could also feel this kind of rumbling under the ground. Um, so that was kind of ominous. Um, the rumbling was, was kind of like a, you know, a large truck passing by um, in the distance. Um, and as we stood here over these minutes, um, it seemed like that rumbling was kind of uh, maybe even getting closer or becoming more frequent. So you can see, yeah, this kind of steaming, um, steaming coming from these cracks. You hear that cracking in the forest? Yeah. And kind of as we're watching this, the fuming does start to get kind of more vigorous here. Yeah, and on our left, you can see the um, yeah the fuming is kind of getting worse. I'm just kind of letting it play through so you can kind of get a sense of, of in real time what we were watching as this was developing. Okay, then you know within moments of when that video ended, things got really bad really quick, and the fuming just became super thick and enveloped us. We had obviously put on our gas masks. Um, here you can hear um, police cars and fire trucks um, in the distance, and you can see the fume coming out of that crack is much thicker, and we've had to step back. There's some extra beeping, and that's our SO2 badge that's alarming because the sulfur dioxide levels are very high, and that's obviously uh, uh, indicated that magma is very close to the surface. Often that you see, um, you know, the opening sequence of a fissure, um, but we were lucky to be there, well, lucky I guess, um, to kind of document it, um, you know, as it as it happened. So over the, that was the beginning stage, day or so of the eruption, and as the days went on, um, the next couple of weeks went on. Many other fissures opened um, and stopped and switched around. Um, and eventually, within a few weeks, the activity focused on kind of the main vent, which was Fissure 8 here. And you can see it has large fountainings, built a cone, and it's feeding lava into a large channelized flow here. We're standing on the rim here watching it. But the, the fountaining there was uh, at times up to 80 yards high, but maybe more typically 30 to 50 yards, and this channel is really enormous um, just because of the volume of lava that's coming out of that vent. Yeah, so, you know, the eruption um, by the third week or so really progressed into large, fast-moving flows, very destructive, and here's one of the flows um, moving towards the coast, and you can just get a sense of all of the property that's being destroyed um, 
of Hydra's flow, covering farmland, destroying homes, unfortunately. Um, so it was um, unfortunately very destructive. And that Fisher 8 flow, um, the one that I showed where we were at the channel edge, within a week it migrated uh, to the coast and it hit the uh, Kapoho area. And Kapoho had a number of subdivisions, vacation land here, uh, Kapoho farm lots, Kapoho beach lots here. And all of these subdivisions were totally um, covered by the flow um, eventually. The lava actually filled in this bay as well. Um, so this, most of this area that you see in this frame is uh, totally covered by lava now. So there were hundreds of homes destroyed in a span of um, just a few days, unfortunately. And obviously, as you can imagine, it was really tough um, you know, to see this level of destruction you know, in the community. So this is a video of uh, Katie collecting a lava sample. And kind of as I talked about for the Pua eruption, collecting lava samples, uh, liquid lava samples, is very important to understand the, um, the source of that magma. And, and this was particularly important for the Lower East Rift Zone eruption in 2018, because what we saw, we saw a pattern where the initial lava that was coming out wasn't very vigorous. It was, um, and the chemistry showed that this was old lava that was kind of stored uh, within the rift zone under the surface and these old pockets of magma it was cooler, it's more viscous, uh, kind of sticky. And that's why it wasn't all that vigorous in the opening uh, two weeks or so. Um, but then within two weeks or so, um, fresh lava was kind of moving, a magma was kind of moving into the system was much hotter, more fluid, and that's what caused some of those very destructive flows that I showed in the earlier slides. Um, so the, the, the sampling, the geochemistry, the chemistry of this lava was really uh, the key to understanding this pattern of the eruption going from kind of low vigor to very high vigor. And um, the fact that we were tracking the chemistry on a daily basis meant that actually um, the geochemists were able to kind of more or less forecast um, when that change would occur, or at least anticipate that and occur uh, that that change would occur soon. Okay, so that was uh, we talked about the Pua eruption, summit eruption here, and then the Lower East Rift Zone eruption. And when we had that Lower East Rift Zone eruption in 2018, uh, it drained magma from the, the main magma chamber is below the summit here, below the caldera, and it feeds magma via conduit along the rift zone to it, well, this Lower East Rift Zone eruption. This Lower East Rift Zone eruption was so voluminous that it drained magma from the summit magma chamber at a very high rate, it drained a lot of magma. What that did is it caused the caldera floor to drop, um, kind of collapse in and subside. And it dropped by more than 500 yards, which is a lot. And so what I'll be talking about is what happened after the 2018 eruption, after that big collapse event or collapse events at the summit. What happened is here, here is actually Holy Mountain Mountain Crater. It's, it's much bigger, much deeper, um, totally collapsed around here. And what we saw about a year after the eruption, 2018 eruption end, is that water started to seep into the bottom. And uh, this is the first time that a sizable body of water has been observed in this, at the summit in you know, over 200 years. And it was very clearly groundwater that was kind of seeping in. So basically that collapse was just so large that it kind of penetrated into the, below the groundwater table. And eventually as things kind of cooled off over, the, over a year or so, the groundwater kind of seeped back in. And we were uh, watching this water lake with great concern because there is a history at, at Kilauea, the summit, of magma interacting explosively with groundwater. And so here we have, you know, groundwater that's right at the surface. Perhaps that may have, might, um, you know, make the summit more susceptible to explosive activity. I think that was, you know, that was a real concern at the time. So we're watching things very closely. Um, and that was 2019 to 2020. And in December 2020, we actually had magma or lava return to the summit. Thankfully, it did not cause large-scale explosive activity. Basically, the lava poured into the bottom of the crater, boiled off that water lake within an hour, hour and a half, and just started passively filling the bottom of the crater with lava from these fissure, uh, these new fissures. Um, so here's Halimakumau Crater, uh, and you can see the lava. This is the first morning of the eruption. Lava is just kind of passively filling that. Thankfully, no explosive activity, or at least large-scale explosive activity. 
Okay, so we have a thermal camera that's on the rim and it provides a very nice view of kind of um, what parts of the lake uh, in that eruption were active and inactive. And here's the vent on the west side of the lake. And you can kind of see pretty rapidly that the eastern part of that lake kind of solidifies and you're just left with liquid uh, fluid lava on the surface on the western portion. Sometimes a little bit of it oozes out on the margins, but it's mostly limited to the west side. And the fact that the lava, you know, uh, became limited to the west side was kind of a testament to the fact that the eruption rates were kind of gradually decreasing through time. And eventually they, they reached a level where they just kind of dropped and the eruption ended in May of 2020, 2021. Sorry. So that eruption went from December 2020 to May 2021, 2021, about six months. After May, there was a few months of quiet at the summit. And then we had another eruption at the summit. That one started in late September of 2021, and it's going on today as I speak in January of 2022. And all it, it opened, the main vent is also on the west side of the crater here. And it's basically just adding more lava to uh, Hale Ma'u Ma'u. You also get a sense of how big that 2018 collapse was here. Um, but these two eruptions that we've had over the past year are really, I think, a testament to the fact that um, Kilauea goes through these cycles where the summit will collapse, create a big depression, and then it will refill with lava. So we had the big collapse in 2018, created the, the large summit depression, um, and now it seems like we're in this kind of refilling phase of that collapse. Okay, so that this uh, new eruption that began in September uh, 2021, a few months ago, it's still ongoing. And this is showing one of the first nights of the eruption when the fountain was more vigorous than it is today. It's definitely more subdued. Um, but the fountain here is, is pretty high, up to 50 yards or so. Um, it's coming through the center of the lake here. Um, here's another time lapse, thermal time lapse of the new eruption or the, or the current eruption, filling in the crater more, uh, raising the level of lava in the crater, uh, almost to the rim here in this first kind of down drop block. Um, we have these islands that are actually kind of being lifted um, up. And we have uh, the activity, the vent activity focused on the, on the west side again. And again, as the eruption rates are kind of decreasing, the lava is kind of becoming, once again, kind of limited to the western side of the lake, just like we saw in the eruption from earlier last year. So, like I said, this eruption is still ongoing. Um, you can um, come into the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and actually see the lava from a lava viewing area. Um, and uh, just wanted to say thank you. Um, and here is the uh, web page for HBO, and here's an email if you have any questions. So I just want to thank you again.